by Maria Masunda. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. I will read the scripture reading from the International Children's Bible Version, Genesis chapter 38, verse 26. Do you not recognize them? He said, she is more in the right than I. She did this because I did not give her the son, my son, Sheila, as I promised. And Judah did not have physical relations with her again. Our speaker today is, is coming from, our speaker today is Pastor Dwight Seek. He's coming to us from Flora Press Church. Please welcome to Gunnerville SCA Church. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I remember that from the last time. I do. And I think you are the same one that it read the scripture the last time I was here, I believe, right? That's that is just fantastic. Amen. What a blessing that is. What a blessing. Well, it's a blessing to be with you again. You realize it was August of last year, getting close to a whole year. Time flies. So it's good to be back with you, and uh, my wife w is unfortunately not with me. We uh, welcomed a new kid, and I mean that literally, because I know you're looking at me and going, okay, you look a little old to be having children. We didn't have children, but our goats did. <laughs> so when I say we welcomed another kid, I meant that literally, we actually had a goat that gave birth last evening, and uh, so she's there just making sure that mama and baby are all gonna be okay and, and be all right. Um, so she's not with me, but my mother was able to join me today, so I'm glad that we could be with you here today. Let's pray before we begin. Father, thank you so much that we could be here together, and we ask for your Holy Spirit to, to take your words and to minister them in the very unique way for each individual. We all have our own unique experience with you, and therefore, we need the Spirit to work in that unique way for each of us. We ask this because of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Traitors should be stripped of all sources of income and banned from re-entering the country for life. So said the deputy chairman of Russia's Security Council, Dmitry Medvedev. But he is only expressing really what really all of us as humans think about traitors. Traitors don't carry any positive thoughts for any of us, do they? We don't like traitors. In fact, one of the most despicable people in American history is a guy named Benedict Arnold, who was a traitor to the revolutionary cause and sided with the British. We don't like traitors. And when somebody goes as far as to be a traitor to their side, even if they would repent, we want to keep them tucked away in a corner, do we not? We want to make sure that they don't reoffend. In fact, when you think about criminals, honestly, criminals have a poor, I should say, we as humans have a poor rate of reform. And usually, people reoffend. And the level of depravity usually increases the chances of reoffending. You probably are going to have a greater chance to rehabilitate somebody who stole a candy bar than a pedophile. But I want you to think about this. And the reason I'm pointing this out is I want you to then expand to the big picture. 
Because as Christians, we all believe in redemption. We believe in a heaven. But you know, it's pretty amazing what God has in store for the human race, given we are the traitors. You realize that? We are the traitors of the universe. In the entirety of the universe, we are the world that rebelled against God and joined the enemy. And I think it is, I think it is amazing that not only is God willing to forgive, but let's take a look at what he's willing to do. And we're going to see that in a, in a unique story in the Old Testament, one that you may not have necessarily taken the time to consider. And it's interestingly enough, a story that is tucked into the middle of another story. Genesis chapter 38 is tucked into the middle of the story of Joseph, and I want you to turn to Genesis 37. Genesis 37. I'm going to read verse 34 to the end in Genesis 37, and it says, Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. <clears throat> and all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. Him, and he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now, this is Jacob mourning the loss of Joseph. And here's what verse 36, the last verse of chapter 47 says, or 37, I'm sorry. Now, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. Now, given that that is the last verse of chapter 37, what would you expect to see in the beginning of chapter 38? Right? Yeah. But guess what? You don't see that until chapter 39. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer... That's how 39 starts. We have 38 tucked into the middle of this story. I'm going to read the first three chapters, or I'm sorry, the first three verses of chapter 38. Um, I will stop there. It's, it's a rather... It's, it's, it's a disturbing chapter. And, and actually, you, if you read this, you may wonder why on earth God included this in the sacred canon. Why is it there? But let's read the first three verses, and then we're going to consider. Verse 1 of chapter 38 starts out, It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers, and visited a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. Now, Judah has left his brothers. Now, he has left his family. But at this time of earth's history, in the time of the patriarchs, what is the church? Now, that seems like a funny question, but I want you to think about it. What is the church? Is there a church like we see in the New Testament, like we have today? No, it doesn't appear so. So what was the church? The church was the family, and specifically Abraham's family, correct? The descendants of Abraham, that was the church. If you remember the story of Abraham, it says when he was in Herod and they left, it says that Abraham took all of the souls that they had won in Herod as they moved on family with the church. So not only has Judah left his family, he's left the church. And he's gone out and he's joined himself to this heathen woman. The next two verses tell us, and Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. Now Judah had three sons. I want to tell you the story, share the story. You may be familiar, familiar with it, you may not. But Judah had three sons. 
His oldest son took a wife named Tamar. That son died, and in their culture, you may be familiar with their culture, what was the culture of that day? So when, when his oldest son died, what happened to his widow? She was passed to the next son, right? So the second son took her as a wife, but he also died. And so by their, their custom and their culture, the third son should have taken her as a wife. Well, he was a little bit younger apparently, but when he became of age, daddy was apparently not too excited about, excited about passing his third son on to this woman who's already killed two of his sons. Now, it wasn't her fault. I say that tongue in cheek. But I can understand as a father that he would be a little hesitant. And so he is. He's hesitant and he does not give his third son to be her husband. And she hatches a scheme. You may be familiar with this scheme. She hatches a scheme to be with her father-in-law who does fall into this scheme. It's a pretty despicable thing, quite honestly. And we find out that she, uh, she becomes pregnant. She becomes pregnant. The father-in-law is the father. And let's take a look at how Judah responds when he finds out. I find this interesting. If you go back to Genesis chapter 38, Genesis 38, look at verse 24. It says, and it came to pass about three months after that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. So Judah said, bring her out and what? Let her be burned. Isn't this interesting? And I think this helps us to illustrate, it illustrates a point. When you have unresolved sin in your life, you become very harsh. And amazingly and ironically enough, you become harsh against the people that have committed the same sin that you are guilty of. He becomes harsh. Here's this woman, and he says, burn her. Now, where else do we see this, this same sentiment? Don't we see this in the life of David as well? Do you remember the story with David? David uh, of course, with this story of Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet comes in and he sets him up and he says, hey, there was a man, he had a hundred sheep and he had a visitor and he wanted to serve some lamb chops to that visitor and instead of killing one of his own 100 sheep, he went to his neighbor who had only one and he stole his sheep so that he could slaughter it and feed his neighbor. And what did David respond? Or I should say, how did David respond? He got mad, as anybody should. We should all be righteously indignant over that kind of a story. And when David hears it, he says, oh my goodness, kill that man, execute him. And we all know the story, and Nathan goes, what? What did Nathan say? You're the man, David. You're the man. But don't you see, folks, when we have unresolved sin, we are harsh with others. I want you to keep this in mind when you encounter somebody who's very harsh. Rather than taking it personally, maybe you got to get on your knees and say, Lord, be with this person. Be with them. What is in their life that is unresolved? Help them to come to you to find the release of whatever guilt or shame or burden that is resting upon them. But we see that principle. But let's keep going here. It says, let her be burned. But when she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man 
whom I am child, these belong to. I think hopefully you're familiar enough with this story. But we see something here because our scripture reading says that when this was presented publicly, now let me, before we take a look at, at Judah's response, which we've already looked at, Judah could have done like most people do, right? And what, what, what do most of us do? And I, I, I'm not trying to be unusually uh, harsh, but what do most public figures do when faced with the revealing of some sin or crime in their life? What do they usually do? They deny it, correct? I think, I think about that. Man, if I had been in Judah's shoes, I would have denied that. Here, this is publicly. She's calling me out publicly. She's got me dead to rights. I can deny this. And think about it. <clears throat> Don't you think he would have gotten away with it? Absolutely he would have. Everybody would have believed him. And he's about to kill the witness to the, to the whole problem anyway. All he's got to do is deny it and move on. But look what, he, look what he does. This is, folks, this is a beautiful story. This is the gospel story in the Old Testament, but it's in a very, very small, small kind of snapshot. Verse 26 says, So Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I, because I did not give her to Shelah, my son, and he never knew her again. Now, there are three elements and there are three elements to conversion. There are three elements to being born again. What is the first one? What does Judah do first? Acknowledges it. He accepts it. He owns his sin. He said, yes, they are mine. Yes, I did this. I am guilty. And then secondly, what does he do? Yes, he does. And he does not try to share the blame, does he? You see, this is something that happens so often. I'll tell you, we're, we uh, are fairly guilty of this, right? Yeah, I did it, but... I did it, but they, if, you know, if they hadn't done this, then I wouldn't have done this. But no, he doesn't, he doesn't point an accusing finger at her, does he? No. As a matter of fact, he says something else. He says, she's more righteous than I am. And then the third thing is what? And I think, as you said, repentance. What is part of repentance? It's a turning away. He turns away from his sin. Those three elements. But we see here the conversion experience in the life of Judah. Have you ever thought about the life of Judah much? I never had, and I must say this, I am ever grateful to a man named Ron Dupree. He's the one that gave a presentation on the life of Judah, and when I heard that story, I said, that is incredible. That is awesome. It's one of the greatest stories in the Bible. And I have loved it ever since. We're not done. Folks, this gets a whole lot better. I want you to take a look. We're going to follow Judah now as we go through this. Before we kind of begin to follow Judah a little bit more, I want you to take a look at the end of uh, chapter 38. Look at the end of chapter 38. Let's look at the very last verse, 29. There were twins that were born. Okay? There were twins that were born. Then it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly and she said, how did you break through? This breach be upon you, therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out had, who had the scarlet thread on his hand and his name was called Zira. Now remember those names, Perez and Zira. We're gonna see them a little bit later. But this is fascinating. But I want you to go back and let's consider, let's consider Judah. I want you to go to chapter 42 in Genesis. <clears throat> chapter 42. Now, I want you to remember this too, because as we look at this story, 
like, like in verse 26 of chapter 38, you have to really think about it. If you do just a quick reading, you won't catch a lot of these things. And you'll just kind of pass on and you won't really allow the power of God's word to sink in. And I think the same can be here uh, in Genesis 42. Look at the first four verses of Genesis 42. It says, when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. So Joseph's 10 brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. Now that tells us something very significant without actually saying it. Let's do the math first to determine what it's telling us and what has taken place. How many sons does Jacob have? Go ahead, you can say it, it's okay. It's safe. 12. We can account for two of them, can we not? Where is Joseph? In Egypt. So that leaves how many? 11. Does Benjamin go down? Okay, that leaves how many? 10. But Judah has left his brothers, correct? So how many should we have left? But wait, how many brothers went down? What does that tell us? Judah's back. Right, Judah's back. Judah is now back with the family, and he's back in the church. Think about that. That's why it's so important that you meditate upon the scriptures. Because otherwise you may just blow right past that and not even give it a second thought. But the conversion experience has happened. Judah is now back with his family. And the ten brothers go down into Egypt. Now, we know, help me out here, what happens? They go down, they get their grain, and then they head back home, and what happens? What happens? Give me a little bit. Summarize this story for me a little bit. I got to engage you folks. I don't want you to go to sleep. There's plenty of time to take naps. Sabbath morning during the worship service is not one of those times. So I want you to stay engaged. So what happens? They go down, they get their grain. And then what? Well, well let, let's start there. What happens in Egypt when they, when they arrive? Okay, they meet Joseph unbeknownst to them. But what does Joseph do? Joseph, he, he, does he send all 10 brothers back? No, one stays, right? Simeon stays. And what does he tell them? He's kind of tough on them. And he says, he, he, he agrees that he'll give them some more grain if they need it, right? But what is the requirement to receive more grain? Bring back Benjamin, correct? So they go back to tell daddy that the only way they're ever going to get any more grain is they're going to have to take Benjamin with them. Now, when things start to get rough and old Mother Hubbard's cupboards start to get bare and they need some more grain, what does Jacob say about sending Benjamin? No way. I want you to turn to chapter 42, verse 37. Okay, look at verse 37. Chapter 42, 37 says, Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then he would bring down my gray hair to sorrow to the grave. So we see that not only does he say no, but then to try and entice him, Reuben. Now, what is Reuben's role in the family? He, he plays a very significant role in the family. Who is he? He's the oldest, right? And we know the culture that comes with 
with significant responsibility and blessings. He is the oldest, but, but Jacob does not accept Reuben's proposal that he be responsible. But now look, somebody else steps forward. Somebody else steps forward. Let's go to chapter 43, starting in verse 1. It says, Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, Ye shall not see his face unless you bring this brother. Now let's go to uh, verse 8. Then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him from my hand. You shall require him if I do not bring him back to you and set him before you. Then let me bear the blame forever. So Judah steps forward with an offer and says, I will be the surety for him. Judah now accepts, I'm sorry, Jacob now accepts Judah's offer and is willing to send Benjamin. Now I want you to consider this. You could say, well, he was just more desperate. But that, that doesn't explain it. Because even if he had gotten more desperate, if that was the only reason, then he would just would have gone back to Reuben and said, okay, Reuben, I'll take, your, I'll take you up on this. He accepts Judah's offer. He does not accept Reuben's offer. You'll see this when we take a look at chapter 49 and you see the blessing that Jacob places on his sons. Reuben had a very shifty, weak character. And Jacob knew this. In fact, where did we see this manifested? Where did we see this kind of weak and shifty character manifested by Reuben? With Joseph initially, right? Did, did Reuben really want to hurt Joseph? No. What should Reuben have done in that circumstance? Yeah. He was the oldest brother. He carried that responsibility and authority. He very clearly should have said, we are not going to hurt our own brother. Take that young man out of that pit and we're going to send him back to his father. Not having any of this nonsense. But he didn't. In fact, interestingly enough, whose plan was it to sell him into slavery in Egypt? It was Judah's. You're going to see something else about that that, to me, I think is, is incredible. But Judah now offers to, to uh, be the surety. But what happens? We're going to look at, uh, I'm not going to read these passages in Judah chapter, or and I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 44, but I want you to think about what happens uh, when they go back. They go back.